Welcome, I'm Allison Rivett, Associate Director of the President's Arts Initiative, a new endeavor at the University of Michigan that is in its startup phase, a period to try out new models for the arts at Michigan to identify goals and craft a large scale initiative. The Arts Initiative seeks to spotlight the capacities of the arts focused units at the university and to forefront the arts to the wider university, integrating the arts as part of a University of Mich Michigan education. And it seeks to demonstrate how the arts can uniquely make visible and catalogs, catalyze dialogue around the most challenging issues facing us today. As we wind down this academic year, one like no other, the Arts Initiative is proud to have just launched its first major artist residency with internationally recognized musician Yo-Yo Ma. He is working with a group of Michigan-based artists and students from all three campuses on a project that explores frameworks for thinking about the past year when many of our community have been isolated at home, but also able to newly appreciate their own locales. This is the final installment of the Future of Art series this academic year. The series was framed by Rebecca, Rebecca Modrak, faculty at the Stamp School of Art and Design, as a space to explore questions that are common across the arts. It centers on the ways the arts are shifting in our response to our rapidly changing world and how they can lead the way to thinking about the future we want to create. I am pleased that this panel is in collaboration with the Digital Studies Institute, which like the Arts Initiative is a space for individuals with far ranging fields of expertise to push the boundaries of contemporary discourse around the ways we interact with each other through emerging modalities. I introduced Marissa Olson, who joined the Digital Studies Institute in November of last year as executive director. She is both an artist and a theorist whose work critiques internet culture and media through the lenses of gender and politics. I will outline a snapshot of her many accomplishments as a practitioner, faculty, curator, and theorist. Her work has been shown at the Whitney Museum and Venice Biennale, and she has been artist in residence at Brown University, IBEAM, Banff Center and the Atlantic Center for the Arts to mention a few of the markers of her accomplishments as an artist. She has curated projects at the Guggenheim, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the New Museum in New York. She has studied fine art at Goldsmiths College, history and consciousness of consciousness at UC Santa Cruz, and rhetoric film and media at UC Berkeley. She has taught at Bard, NYU, and RISD. Marissa has published about politics and post-internet art a term and discourse she introduced in the mid 2000s in numerous academic journals and collections, as well as the Guardian, Art Forum, and Wired, where she was an early staff writer. We're fortunate that the University of Michigan to now count Marissa Olson as one of our community. I now turn to her to introduce today's discussion on technology and the future of art, and our two featured panelists, Salome Esega and American Artist. Thank you so much for that introduction, Allison. Um, and also thank you for all of your work on organizing this event. It's a pleasure to collaborate with you. I also want to thank Christina Olson, the director of the University's Museum of Art for inviting the DSI to collaborate with the Arts Initiative. Um, I particularly want to thank not only the people who joined us in the audience today, but the artists, American artist and Salome Asega, whom I'll be introducing in a moment. Um, and first, I'd like to introduce the Digital Studies Institute itself. Uh, we are a center where faculty, students, and visitors can focus their research on the cultural implications of technology, particularly in relationship to race, disability, gender, sexuality, power, access, and ethics, among other foci. Um, and I think that our focus and the focus of the Arts Initiative align particularly well when it comes to thinking about the future of the arts in relationship to technology as we're looking at here today. So let me just quickly read um, again the, the focus of this panel and, and what we're going to be discussing. And I think that the panelists that we have here could not be better for this subject. Uh, we are looking at the role of the arts in framing and producing social justice commentary and the ways in which they use technology to both critique and intervene in the problematics often posed by technology. 
How can the arts model critiques of technological utopianism? How can the arts lead the way to a better future, which will inevitably be shaped by the technologies we use? So I'd like to introduce American artist and Salome Asega. American artists make thought experiments that mine the history of technology, race, and knowledge production, beginning with their legal name change in 2013. Their artwork primarily takes the form of sculpture, software, and single channel video. Artist is a resident of Red Bull Arts Detroit, a recipient of the Queens Museum Jerome Foundation Fellowship, a former resident of IBEAM Pioneer Works and the Whitney Museum Independent Study Program. They've exhibited at the Whitney Museum, MoMA PS1, Studio Museum in Harlem, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, and Nam June Paik Center in Seoul. They've had solo museum exhibitions at the Queens Museum, the Museum of the African Diaspora in California. Their work's been featured in the New York Times, Art Forum, and Huffington Post. Artist is a 2021 Regents Lecturer at UCLA and teaches critical theory at the School for Poetic Computation. Salome Asega is an artist and researcher based in Brooklyn. Salome has participated in residencies and fellowships with IBEAM, the New Museum, the Laundromat Project, and Recess. She's exhibited at the Shanghai Biennale, MoMA, Carnegie Library, the August Wilson Center, Knockdown Center, and more. She's given presentations and lectures at Performa, IEO, Brooklyn Museum, MIT Media Lab, NYU, and more. Salome is currently a Ford Foundation Technology Fellow, Landscaping New Media Artist, and Organization Networks. She sits on the boards of National Performance Network and Power Plant, the Youth Digital Art Collaboratory. She received her MFA from Parsons at the New School in Design and Technology, where she teaches classes on speculative design and participatory design methodologies. So I think the way we've all discussed uh, organizing this panel is that each of the artists is going to speak for about 10 minutes on just sort of introducing you a bit to their overall practice and focusing on two or so projects in particular that are germane to the topic. And then we're going to have a bit of a group discussion. This is actually, even though the artists both know each other quite well, um, they've never been on a panel together. So they probably have questions for each other too, which is very exciting. Um, and then after a bit of talking together, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. We already have a few pre-submitted questions, which is wonderful. Um, feel free to start thinking of questions now, submit them in the, uh, in the chat if you would like. Um, and then we'll be taking them a bit later. So thank you so much. We're gonna start with American Artist. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm really happy to be on a panel with Salome, as you mentioned. Um, that's one thing left out of our bios. We are, we are friends and it's really cool to finally publicly be in dialogue. Hopefully it'll happen in the future too. Okay, so let me share my screen. So I want to talk about one project in particular, and then maybe um, if I have time, talk a little bit about how I've been thinking about pedagogy and, and community, because I think it relates to our current discussion. Um, but first, I want to talk about this recent project that I did, which was a, a web commission for the Whitney Museum called Looted. By considering that relationship between imaging and imagining in the registers of Black annotation and Black redaction, I want to think about what these images call forth. And I want to think through what they call on us to do, think, feel in the wake of slavery, which is to say in an ongoing present of subjection and resistance. And I include this quote from Christina Sharp because I'm interested in the way she, she uses these phrases phrases Black annotation and Black redaction uh, to talk about the ways in which um, Black people have performed agency through 
either annotating historical documentation through um, inserting oneself or um, keeping a record and black redaction in sort of choosing when and how to be present. And this kind of resonated with me um, in connection with some works that I've done. One of them being this um, performance work, which was called A Refusal. And this is something where for about a year, I, um, I redacted the images I would post on social media. So images of myself or friends or family or anything of that sort. Every time I would go to post one of these images, instead I would post this blank solid blue image. Um, and I kept a, a printed record of all of the photos I would have shared. And it was a sort of um, a, an effort to critique how it was that I felt people were asked to perform within social media and essentially become the products of these platforms and wanting to visually kind of um, present myself as, you know, having this critical relationship to it and sort of stepping back and questioning it. And it was also my first visual um, exploration of redaction. So the, the sort of using, you know, visual, the removal of, of images um, visually in my work as yeah, part of my practice. So I felt like it kind of had a recurring moment in this, this newer work that I developed over this past year. It is interesting to note here that the redaction of document 105969591 took the form of a whiteout, concealing a good portion of the original text with white blocks. In this way, deviating from the method of censoring the redacted data with opaque black blocks, rendering any information in the dark. And this is a quote from Simone Brown. So that video is from a Target in Minneapolis um, that was looted during the protests in response to the murder of George Floyd. And so during this, this past summer, um, during the pandemic, as well as these protests around uh, police brutality, Black Lives Matter protest, um, I was asked to do this commission um, for the Whitney Museum, or actually I had been asked to do it before that, but that was kind of what was going on in the world at the time that I actually um, began to work on this project. Um, and something that I was sort of thinking about during that time um, is what I say in this quote here, when every image in the museum seems to be boarded up, every item in the collection redacted, it makes it clear that you are not meant to enter the museum. I wanted to question whether a museum even owns the work it says it does, or if it is in fact all stolen and looted property. So this was an image of the Whitney Museum in the process of being boarded up um, in anticipation of protests, um, Black Lives Matter protests. And so I was asked to do this, this commission for the Sunrise Sunset series, which is this ongoing series where um, there's a, a digital intervention into the website that you can see every day at sunrise and sunset. And so I, I was very aware of the fact that at the time you could not enter the museum because of COVID. And then on top of that, it, would also, it was also you know, physically boarded up. And so your only way really to interact with the museum was through the physical or the, the digital website. And so what I ended up doing was um, creating it so that when you arrive on the website during one of those times, the website turns black and all of the images on the website are boarded up with this image of plywood. And for me, I really wanted to represent um, the possibility of, of, of an absence of all of these images, um, all of these works going missing. And the Whitney Museum has their collection on their website. So all of the images in the collection essentially, you know, became boarded up. And so 
in one sense, it's mirroring the literal facade of the museum, which is boarded up, um, mirroring that in the, the digital interface, which is the only way to access the museum, but also just kind of raising this question of, you know, what if everything had been stolen? What if everything had gone missing? Do museums even own the content that they claim to own in the first place? Um, as well as also, you know, seeing, seeing the image of the boards, I think some people read it also as like um, a, a protective act, but for me, it was more about, you know, what if, what if these works were gone? What if the images are no longer there? And another thing I want to talk about is how I've been sort of um, approaching, you know, my my work as an educator. And um, something I think a lot about is this notion of study and all the ways that it manifests. And though it's a very familiar word, I think there's a lot that can be read into this notion of study. Um, and I often refer to this form of study as I understand it through the authors Fred Moten and Stefano Harney, uh, who wrote The Undercommons, um, and all of the people that they, they also allude to in their own research and writing. And so I'm going to try and very briefly play a clip where Stefano talks about this notion of study, and then I'll, I'll get back to my slides. The note, kind of politics in the university, or well, sometimes in what you both call the undercommons of the university. Could you say more about this concept of study? Well, yeah, uh, it is a concept. It's also a kind of practice, I think, that we can undertake and we do undertake in the university. And yet, at the same time, if you were to ask, what's the one thing that you're not able to do in the university? The answer might well come, you're not able to study. Because when you think about what study is, in the way that we understand it as a practice, we're talking about getting together with others, and determining what needs to be learned together and spending time with that material, spending time with each other without any objective, without any endpoint, without any sense that we will ever escape our feeling that we are permanently immature, premature, without credit, and in a kind of mutual bad debt to each other, which we don't intend to repay. And so uh, this is an image from when I was teaching this class through the School for Poetic Computation. And we, we did a, a version of our classes in Detroit. And I was leading this class around, um, around looking at the history of computer technology through this lens of kind of, you know, seeing its relationships to settler colonialism um, and, and exploitation and kind of trying to get a fuller picture of where it is that the ethos of you know Silicon Valley and high technology is derived from, and um, a lot of times I'm teaching these kind of like critical issues that are you know really hard to talk about, but it's important for me that I sort of um, emphasize this you know community aspect of coming together, sharing each other's experiences and and various knowledges, you know, not presuming that anyone's necessarily an expert, but that we're all sort of there to um, come together and, and process this information. So in this case, we all kind of took turns reading from these texts. Um, one of them was The Silicon Valley of Dreams, um, which is a book about settler colonialism and um, com computer technology. And um, yeah, that process kind of informs how I'm thinking about, you know, taking things that otherwise might be inaccessible or like remain extremely theoretical, but trying to um, bring a bring my personal history and everyone's personal history into dialogue when we talk about um, some of these complex complexities. And so yeah, I just wanted to give that sort of preface and maybe in our conversation, um, we can talk a little bit about um, teaching together, so may and I. Thank you. And now I'm going to pass it to Salome. Thank you so much, American. There's um, already I'm starting to see some overlaps in our work and where this conversation could go after. So I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you, Marissa, um, for organizing today and for having us. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, and also just to start, I'll say my name is Salome. My pronouns are she, her. I'm calling in from Brooklyn, New York on Lenape land. Um, I'm a new media artist uh, that it uses a participatory process to make most of my work. Um, right now, there is a group of cishet white men in Silicon Valley that are actively working to build a future for us. Um, without our consent, we are living in their uh, imagination. And I'm very interested in using uh, the power, leveraging the power of collective imagination to create counter futures. So I'll show you um, a couple of projects. So this is um, called Level Up. It's a game that teaches you how to do the real Harlem Shake using Connect. In the summer of 2012, uh, DJ Bauer came out with a song called Harlem Shake, which prompted people to make viral videos like these. And while this might look fun, videos of the real Harlem Shake dance sort of got lost on the internet. You'd have to go pages and pages into a YouTube search before you could find the original dance. So through a residency at the New Museum, I worked with dancer and choreographer Ali Rosa Salas and Light Feet Nation founder Crybaby Cozy and a whole crew of Light Feet dancers to make this game. Um, if you've ever been to New York, Light Feet dancers you might have seen on um, the train, uh, Showtime dancers are like the last keepers of the Harlem Shake. Um, so we mapped uh, the dancers' shoulders movements and uh, using Connect and use that as data for the game. And so this is the, an install shot of the game at Trow Amsterdam. Um, you'd push this big red inviting, uh, inviting button on the left, which launches a minute long instructional round with Crybaby Cozy, where he teaches you the fundamentals of the Harlem Shake. So you're learning um, shoulder work, you're learning footwork, you're learning some like attitude. Um, and then here's a, here's a still from the instructional round. And you know, this project has been installed in a couple of places and I love how it gets museum visitors or gallery visitors to kind of break their performance in those spaces. It asks you to be loud, to take up space, to interact with other people. Um, and you know, I don't, I actually don't know if anyone has ever won the game that that information hasn't mm -hmm. been <laughs> recorded and, and given back to me. Um, so this is another project called IAPO Repository. In thinking about Black artistic and cultural representation and the ways power now operates uh, predictively as much as it does retrospectively, Ayodomola Okunsunde, another artist, and I came together during a residency at IBEAM in 2016 to start this project. Um, the repository has, um, the repository is a resource library that exists in a nondescript future and house, houses a collection of art and artifacts made by and for people of African descent. And uh, the repository has four main divisions, which each require some level of participation to create. So we ask participants to become uh, archivists of the IAPO repository and ask them to invent future artifacts through this card game. So this card game provides a little bit of scaffolding for you know, so you're not just kind of like abstractly thinking about the future at large, like at a large scale. So if you were given this set of cards, you would have to develop a future artifact that is a revolutionary political tool that that somehow incorporates changing color. And then you would draw it on this very, very official document and that you would sign and we would number and we encase an acrylic in a preserve in our manuscript division. So we've hosted public workshops on the street in our neighborhood, and we've also partnered with community-driven organizations, universities, and museums to host us. It's important to me to, in all of my projects to try to make unlikely partnerships to be able to leverage resources and share knowledge between spaces. So a lot of the images that you're seeing from this project come from a successful partnership between VIA, Carnegie Mellon University, and August Wilson Center in Pittsburgh, a legacy Black institution. So through the August Wilson Center lab, we uh, tweaked our workshop curriculum to add uh, three tracks to make time, uh, time for exposure and hands-on exploration with new technologies. That way, participants are more involved in the making process. They're not just dreaming up these future artifacts, they're starting to build them. 
So one workshop track, at, track asks participants to rapid prototype their artifact designs using basic electronic components. Uh, so we're using like microcontrollers, LEDs, butter, buzzers, servo motors. Uh, we also have a VR engineering track that asks participants to sketch their future artifact in 3D space um, using Vive and Tilt Brush. And so this is most of our participants first time in VR. So it's really an opportunity to kind of just like go wild and um, experiment with the tool. Uh, we also have a digital fabrication track where uh, we show participants how to laser cut or 3D print some element of their design um, and um, of their future artifact. So I'm gonna show two examples of things that have come out of our workshops. Um, this is a bodysuit that gives you the calming sensation of being underwater and is a therapeutic tool for treating people with water-related traumas. So the person who drew this was thinking about her, um, her relationship to water, her family's relationship to water, and was thinking about uh, the transatlantic slave trade as being a potential root trauma for her and maybe a shared collective experience. And so uh, she drew this suit and we took the sketch back to the studio and fully realized it. So it's technologically functioning, enabled. And here's um, a video of the suit in action. So I'll just explain to you what's happening in the suit. So there are these um, tubes of water that are pushing water around um, your limbs. So you're hearing this like the nice whir of the liquid. And then at each one of these cuffs, there's um, vibrator motors that are synced to tidal patterns of the Atlantic Ocean. So you're also getting a really nice like undulating vibration, wave-like vibration along your body. Um, here's another artifact. Um, they're affirmation pills, a prescribed or maybe even vitamin-like supplement that when taken gives you a specialized black history lesson. So again, the participant who drew this was thinking about microaggressions and was like, wouldn't it be great if you could just give somebody a pill and they understand your experience and you don't have to go through the intellectual and emotional labor of explaining who you are and who your history. Um, so here is, um, the artifact realized. And so uh, this always makes me laugh because when it's in exhibitions, it's people, it's as if people fall so deep into the narrative of the wall text that they, um, we always catch people taking the pills like as if they'd work, um, which is funny. Um, and so here is when we exhibit EOPL repository, you know, we try to make it an active working space. Um, so you'll see the artifacts are, you know, are in the space. And then the films that we make are projected, you'll see behind. And then the middle is always meant to feel like a lab where people like having seen the repository can continue to contribute to it and add. Um, so there are spaces to draw, play the game and add to our manuscript division. And then we also have um, the rare media division. It's a dead drop uh, library where a visitor can insert a USB stick into a slot and the dead drop will dump a folder of MP3s, PDFs, images, and video files that have influenced the project. So kind of all the research we've been doing along the way. Uh, we like recently updated uh, the design. That's what you see on the right. Um, and that was installed at Carnegie Library. And in this iteration, you can tap these acrylic panels and it'll uh, create like a special custom folder for you that just gets emailed directly as that folder gets emailed directly to your inbox. 
Okay, so alongside um, my personal projects, I just quickly wanted to talk about a space where a lot of the learning I've done is put into community practice. So my friends, Angelina Dream and Anibo Luque founded Power Plant almost six years ago. Then it was a, a pop-up digital art tech school that floated from small galleries in Brooklyn to Red Bull Studios and then to Hunter College. I came in about four years ago when we wanted to start a brick and mortar space, what we call a digital art collaboratory, a space where folks can have unstructured time to use our resources and also sign up for classes. So we found this bright orange beauty salon with Rihanna on the awning and we were like, this is it, this is our space. Um, I think we started with like a $5,000 Kickstarter campaign and bought some computers. We um, sourced much of the material to create the space um, from a warehouse uh, here called Materials for the Arts where you can access free materials like the, the tile, the paint, the tables. Um, so here we are, power plan, an artist-built, interest-driven school and lab. All the classes are pitched and taught by artists, and all the course offerings are determined by what we hear our neighbors and students say they want and need. Our classes range from intro to 3D modeling, to how to design a logo, to camera basics. Our most popular classes are intros to Ableton and CDJs that are taught by local DJs and music producers. And we also offer a suite of practical arts training that's become popular, so like legal basics for artists um, that dives into contracts and how to fi file copyrights. We also have a monthly residency program where artists working with digital tools take over the space to host events and exhibitions. Our current residents include um, Synth Library NYC, Disc Cakes, and Im Infamous uh, Institute of Museums Against All Fucked Up Social Systems. Um, so we often partner with cultural and academic, academic institutions around New York City. Um, this is a partnership we did with the Parsons Scholars Program. Um, this is a program we do every year with Pioneer Works in Brooklyn called Ableton Live Live. We sync all the computers and route them through the same mixer so all the uh, workshop participants can collect, collectively build on the same beat. So I think I'll close there. And I'll pass it to Marissa. Thank you so much. I almost don't know where to begin in terms of asking questions or drawing connections. And I know that those are just a couple of your, both of your many, many interesting projects. Um, so thank you. Thank you again for um, just being here. Um, I've, I was jotting down a couple different notes, things that stood out to me, um, possible, you know, things that we could discuss, um, and I'm sure you have questions for each other. Um, it's interesting that you both kind of brought, I don't know if it's just because this is a university panel or if this is because of what you're thinking a lot about right now, but it's interesting that you did bring up uh, topics related to pedagogy, even though that wasn't explicitly in the panel. Um, but it, it's definitely interesting to think about how you're addressing your kind of, you're bringing together what, what almost kind of used to be called social practice, or maybe it still is, um, and social justice issues um, in, a, in a pedagogical context. Um, and then I think what's also interesting is the way that you're both kind of exploring the use of space in a different way. Um, I think it's connected to these, to the teaching. Um, it's sort of like bringing people together in a way and inviting them to imagine space differently, whether it's through the looting or through kind of use of, um, kind of alternate spaces or it, it depends on the project, but um, are either of those topics, things that you wanna jump on and, and expand upon with your work? Yeah, I mean, I, I think those are those are good topics um, and pretty pretty broad still. I mean, I think we could- Yeah, I'm trying to get, like, like start pedagogy. with something broad that we can hone in on. And, and one in particular, I guess, that I could say about space also is that 
Um, I was thinking actually American as you were talking about how, um, and you know, we kind of take this for granted in new media circles because we, we've been talking about this for a while, but since we have a broader audience here, you know, we can think about how the public sphere now is very much digital, um, whether it's social media, the internet itself, the mobile web, other kinds of platforms. Um, but if we're talking about technology, the arts and social justice, um, it's interesting how your work really addresses that relationship between you know, protest on the streets and protest online or in other forms. Um, and that distinction between online offline space um, and just thinking about the digital public sphere, both of you guys, do you think about that exp explicitly, the, that concept of digital public space? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do like to kind of, you know, merge that relationship between the, the digital and physical. And I, I think that's one thing I was trying to do with that piece looted. Um, and also I think in terms of how we, how we imagine certain dynamics playing out in digital space um, or how we see ourselves in a sort of like digital imaginary, like what Solomon said at the beginning of a presentation, like um, these white cisset men in Silicon Valley, like a sort of like living within their imagination, I thought was a really great way to put it in terms of um, how there's an, an ideal ideating of like a, a potential, you know, future and then us sort of you know operating within that just by nature of how it's imposed within society um and i think in terms of like the looted project just wanting to kind of like crush that relationship or that like um hierarchy that there's a sort of um physical and digital um discrepancy when in reality all of these dynamics are are playing out in both both ways you know Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, just to, to follow up on that, I feel like there's kind of a, you know, the kind of issues we see in physical space are, are amplified or exacerbated in a digital public sphere, right? Like there's a, there's a flow there, like um, those problems don't, <laughs> don't go away on the internet. And so in the same way that we think about uh, organizing in person, we need to think about organizing and stewarding online. And I think that's why um, you know, the deeper that you go into this hole of working with technology and emerging media, like you become more critical. And it's like, it was obvious to me and I'm curious to hear from American, but like teaching has become so much a part of my practice because like, I'm just seeing so much and I want to study with other people, right? Like I need to, we need to figure out ways to combat or lessen harm here. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. The more the more you learn about it, it's just like, I just find myself constantly talking about all the problems. And then it's like, you know, suddenly now I'm educating, suddenly, you know, my practice is a form of pedagogy as well, just because it's like, it's impossible not to address all of these things the more you, you dig into it. Yeah, that was a really interesting reference you made, just thinking about that, the way of thinking about study as, kind of a collective action well that's what i wrote down anyway they didn't use those words but kind of framing it as a collective action something that's done with other people collectively and then something that could be kind of boundless um or that it was okay to be kind of non-teleological um i thought that was kind of interesting as well another thing i was really looking forward to discussing with you two was the idea of using technology to critique technology, basically, that you're, um, and I have to agree, Salome, I love the way you put it, sort of living in the imagination imagination of these guys. That's not what we, where we wanna be. Um, but at the same time, it's sort of like you're using these tools or we're using these tools to critique their affects in a certain way. Um, how does that work? Um, you know, how do we think about that? How do we, and I love you, you, you mentioned the word counter futures. Um, you invoked Fred Moten, American artist. Um, 
are they counter, do we have counter technologies or how are we thinking about this? I mean, the first thing that comes up for me is like, yes, we're, I'm cr critical of technology and I'm working with technology, but I don't hate technology, yeah. right? I just think that there are ways that we can develop um, the tools that we use that are, um, that work for everyone and don't, or not discriminatory and violent, right? And so the first thing that comes to mind for me is I'm thinking about the, the Consentful Tech Project, which starts with the question, what does consent mean when it comes to our data and digital lives? So they've provided a framework for building technology that is held up by the five pillars of um, digital consent, which, which are adopted from Planned Parenthood's definition for sexual consent. So uh, for technology to be consentful, it needs to be uh, freely given, reversible, informed, enthusiastic, and specific. And that's, you can remember that by the acronym FRIES. Yeah, I, I really love that. And I, I agree. It's not that, you know, I, I hate technology, obviously, like I, I love technology. And that's why I feel like it's also acknowledging that I, I do feel like this is something that's not going away. You know, it's, it's something that's becoming more and more ingrained in how we, how we do things. So it's not really a matter of saying like, we shouldn't use it. And I also think that that's maybe like generally not the best, um, way to suggest that we deal with the problem, but rather to, you know, interrogate it and, and see in what ways this is just a um, result of all of the ideas and, and actions that went into it, you know, from its beginning and that sort of continue to manifest in various ways. So, you know, rather than just quitting it or stopping it, which I don't think is necessarily realistic, but just thinking about um, ways in which it could, it could be something else, something that's more, um, accommodating to all of the people that are actually using it and engaging with it. Mm -hmm. And in, in some ways, like our projects aren't so much about technologies as they are about power, right? And being critical yeah. of power, right? And there isn't like, um, I love that you brought up Simone Brown's, uh, you know, Dark Matters, because I, I even think about uh, the way she talks about luminosity and surveillance technology and lighting technology, right? And when she does, She's not starting with the like contemporary bureaucracy of surveillance tech. She's starting by talking about um, uh, lantern laws during slavery, right? Yeah. And so that all of this is um, operates on a historical continuum. And what we're really talking about is is power in people. Totally, and and that just reminds me, like even this framing of technology, it doesn't you know start and stop with computers. It's like it's kind of a way to frame a general. Um, way of operating I think so even thinking of those early forms of people watching other people as a form of technology or at least being in that same lineage and so the power the way that power dynamics have operated through technology you know are um are in a sort of continuum so I I also I, I agree like it's not so much about that word technology or like whatever um you know image comes into mind when you say that, but more about like the power dynamics and how they've, they've played out in familiar ways. And I think maybe talking about it through a history of technology is useful, at least for just like um, recognizing what those paths are in, in that continuum. Yeah, that's great. And I, I was wondering, I'm starting to get distracted by some awesome questions that are coming up in the Q&A, by the way. Uh, this is a great discussion, but before we get to other people's questions, I wanted to say, um, I'm curious what questions came to mind for you two um, about each other's work, because you mentioned that you had a few. I mean, I mean I'm interested to hear from American, like, how did you start your artistic practice to incorporate new media and technology? Like, is there an origin story or creation myth? <laughs> I guess so. I mean, I, I've i like, I don't know, I began just like as someone who draws well, that's sort of my origin origin, but how that got to new media. I mean, I got into like coding and stuff as a teenager through MySpace, customizing my page. That's how I got in like web coding and that kind of- It's a gateway me. It is, it totally is. 
Um, but I think in, in grad school, and it's funny, like you were in the design technology program at Parsons, I was in the fine art program, and there wasn't a lot of conversation around new media. Um, but I, I was really kind of obsessed with the way the internet could, you know, break down these barriers in like the art world. Like I was like, you know, what's with this focus on the gallery or the museum? Like, what about the internet? Like everyone has access to it. And that was, that kind of became like my, my one take that was unique when I was in school. And I think it kind of stayed with me. So I would say that was kind of like my, my origin into that. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question for Salome and yeah, this is something I, I think about a lot, but I've been thinking about it more lately and just like, I, I really appreciate the way that, um, I mean, I, I see you as having a huge influence within art and, and social justice and everything, you know, through Power Plant, through Ford Foundation, things like that. And I, I wonder how you kind of came into that role because I feel like a lot of artists like aren't interested in that or they're not, you know, taking advantage of the power that they have. They're kind of just like, um, I don't know, they just want to be like a, a celebrity or something, but they're not really thinking about, you know, how can I create change or be in a, a position of power? And so I wonder how you kind of got into that and how you see that as being important for an artist. Yeah, I appreciate that question. I feel like, you know, I grew up in, um, I'm Ethiopian American first gen, right? So like grew up with parents that were, were very much like, you need to be a scientist or you need to be an engineer or, you know, doctor, lawyer. And half of my family are some kind of engineer, right? And so, um, but live, live in Ethiopia, right? And so for me, it's just, that was my entry to, um, computing and technology and physical computing in particular. And so um, just like seeing the kind of um, unbound creativity coming from um, East Africa, right? And the ways makers and practitioners were working, but just were not, there was no light being shown there, right? And I also grew up in Las Vegas, another place that like the art world doesn't really look at the Southwest generally, right? And so for me, it was, I've always been surrounded by people that, um, have are telling the are the best storytellers right and I just have always wanted to make sure that my practice um, was cooperative and distributive that I was like always trying to bring and work with as many people as possible to hopefully get us out of these centrisms I mean like mm -hmm. you know everything feels like it's so coastal <laughs> centered yeah yeah yeah, yeah totally um, there's an interesting question that came through the chat, um, which was, I think it's interesting. I, I'm curious if it's interesting to you guys, which was about, let me see who asked this. I can give them a proper shout out. Um, Harsh Samuel Ganesh asked, is the internet overrepresented in conversations about technology and future life? It's certainly a paradigm shifting thing, but do you feel like there are other aspects of technology that go under the radar? And I, I've been interested in this too. Um, I know people like Eric Schmidt, ex-CEO of Google said in, I think it was like 2013, um, that the internet, as we know it, the World Wide Web is gonna die soon. Um, you did show other work that you make in other technologies, um, but what do you, what do you think overall, um, about that question or what, what does that question prompt for you? Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good question. Um, I do feel like the internet is definitely highly represented. I don't know if I would say it's overrepresented. I, I feel like, but I do feel like there are certain technologies that get more um, airtime than others. And I think it's particularly ones that veer towards like entertainment or um, visual experience and kind of like um, augmenting visual experience. I think those are the kinds of technologies that um, get the most attention. And I think that some things that aren't, you know, 
as prominent it's because like they're not like from a consumer standpoint they're just not interesting and you know that might be like mm -hmm. the, the giant you know data centers or the kind of like all the the physical manifestations of how these things you know get made or anything like that or um i don't know other forms of data accumulation that are really vast but are just not that interesting to like talk about for most people um or that people don't know about or that they don't know about yeah exactly structure mm -hmm. yeah i mean there are all kinds of you know algorithmic decision making tools risk assessment tools that are now like determining all forms of social service delivery right everything yeah. from like public housing to welfare benefits to you know kind of all these public goods are now being determined um by these algorithmic tools and that's something that i feel like was more centered uh, and a larger conversation about technology um but i will say just like in an arts context you know i think i agree with american that like um the internet is very much like represented in an, in an art context um but i feel like there have been so many big group shows about the internet but like That's true. we haven't really had uh like curatorial scholarship that delves deep and is specific about the internet so even though it's something we hear about a lot i feel like there's still a lot of work to be done to get deep to go deeper hmm. no, I, interesting no, I, I agree and I, I think that's that's why i said like i don't know if i would say it's overrepresented it's more like certain aspects of the internet are really represented but there's so much more to it you know that i think really could be super fascinating, you know, for artists to investigate. Yeah, I find myself lately stopping, as I did just a moment ago, when I say internet, and then I stop and I say, I mean, World Wide Web or mobile web or something like that, because um, internet is kind of a really broad term itself and has a long history and has different you know, cultural imaginations and manifestations and implications. Um, so, yeah, you're right. That's really interesting. And I'm also curious, um, this is an interesting segue, obviously, with the work that you guys do, and I, I know other projects that you didn't even show, you, so much time and research goes into what you do, just kind of on an ongoing basis, I think you're at those type type of artist that you're just kind of open to the world, always looking and thinking. Um, what are you thinking about right now in terms of new technological developments and, and parallel political concerns? I mean, I guess it's, it's sort of the equivalent to what are you working on next, but I don't know if that's exactly how you work in terms of linear one project to the next. Um, what, I'm like, what am I working on? <laughs> well, I, I mean, that's, it's hard to ask you that because I know you guys are such polyhyphenate artist, researcher, thinker, writer, people. I, you know, right now I've been thinking about, um, a black girl musical play in particular, hand clapping, um, and being like a technique uh, of steganography or encryption, right? So yeah. being able to, um, black girl musical play hand clapping has always been a way of encoding secret messages, right? In plain sight, hiding in plain sight. Um, so just thinking about um, playful ways we're able to transmit information and data to each other. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Do you know how you're going to manifest that yet? Yeah, so last year actually, or I'm like, time is so confusing because last year it didn't really <laughs> happen, but um, 2019, I, know. I um, did a project at the High Line where I worked with a group of young girls um, through a program called Wide Rainbow. And um, we were thinking about uh, the Smart City project that's happening in Hudson Yards and um, the like hyper branding of, corp uh, of public space by corporations. Um, and so we developed, a, we restyled 
Hey Mary, it's a classic hand clapping game, came up with new choreography and did like a public uh, intervention and demonstration on the High Line where we led a procession down to like a project site and then broke into hand clapping and then taught other people in the park how to do this, this game. And we also passed out like little folded hearts uh, that when you opened up had the, the lyrics to the hand clapping game. And so now I'm, I'm trying to figure out like a part two to that experience that is maybe just um, screen based. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm very interested in the ways that we can, you know, um, we can, yeah, transmit and tell stories in plain sight. That's beautiful. That's great. What about you, American? Yeah, I I was gonna say also about um, this idea of like what's highly represented within the internet or like what technologies are highly represented. I also had this thought just about um, the sort of social dynamics surrounding, you know, these various technologies um, and I guess like how they how they affect us personally and historically and that kind of ties into what I'm working on now because I'm I'm doing this research project that's gonna you know unfold into first like a website and then hopefully some other other works as well um, but it's looking at the the life and legacy of Octavia E. Butler and um because I, I grew up in the same town as her and so I'm I'm also thinking about um the legacy of Black families migrating from the Southern United States to the West, um, and also the the rocket science industry within Altadena, Pasadena, in California, um, as well as like the science fiction scene and sort of all of these different um, contextual threads that I think you know were present for her existence and how how. Um, those both informed her and how she informed those other things surrounding her. And so it's kind of like, um, yeah, looking at all these tangential threads around Butler's life and work. So that's kind of like what I'm doing. And, and it, it just it just connects with like my general interest in just, you know, wanting to understand more historically how all of these things tie together. So even though I feel like very much rooted in like technology or the internet, like, um, I don't know, it's that to me opens just like, opens up so much more. Well, it kind of goes back to what Salome was saying, I think about how it's nice when people can just sort of dive deeper into the timeline um, and look at the, the bigger history and context of these technologies and their surrounding impacts and contributors and factors. Yeah. Um, so that sounds great. I mean, Octavia Butler. Um, let's see, I, I think we're getting close to time, but I'm noticing a trend with a couple of different questions that have come in um, regarding reaching out to specific communities. So for instance, here's one submitted by Gina that says, similar to Stefan's question, what are your thoughts about social media practices by an individual that help versus harm supporting BLM and other social justice topics. And there are a couple other questions along these lines. It's like, how do you uh, reach and support a specific community um, and you know, foster diversity but not alienate anyone? Things along those lines. Um, do you either of you have any thoughts about that? I'm like, um, this is such a big question and I'm yeah, I'm mad that I like impulsively, instinctively like don't have anything generative to say, but I'm like, for some reason was drawn back to what is what happened almost a year ago with um, the Blackout Tuesday hashtag mm -hmm. on social. And yeah. just, um, I, I just like for anyone having a social media practice, I would just say like, really think through. Um, yeah like how, you want to talk about how, that just in case anybody for some reason isn't in the loop on that or doesn't doesn't know what you're thinking about that yeah i mean and this was something that happened i think last june or july where people were <laughs> that's exactly what you know thinking of like <laughs> you, you nailed it yeah <laughs> 
Um, so it was this social media campaign where um, people were asked to post a black square and hashtag black, uh, Blackout Tuesday. And um, people immediately jumped on this trend, but in doing so also hashtag Black Lives Matter. And in doing so kind of uh, blacked out the channels, uh, like a hashtag, an important hashtag where people were getting information about um, protesters, protester safety, um, where you know ha actions were happening. And so completely, yeah, closed down that channel of information. And so I'm just like, I, that's I guess not the kind of action just... where, that American was talking about. <laughs> exactly, exactly that. <laughs> yeah. There's different. There's different kinds of redaction. Yeah. What yeah. That, that. Do you have any thoughts, American? Yeah, I actually want to. Yeah, I respond to that specifically. Like, what what happened on social media last summer? <laughs> <laughs> I know what you <laughs> tweeted last summer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because there was also like, um, there was a lot of people like um, being like, "Oh, like check out this black artist," you know, and and trying to support yeah. Black Lives Matter like in like conspicuous ways, like you know, trying to be more like vocal about it. Um, and it was weird because it's like. You know, people doing work like my work were getting more attention because I'm like I've been talking about you know social justice issues long before this was happening, um, and it was like it was in one sense it's like nice to have that engagement, but at the same time you're like why you know do such horrible things need to happen in order for people to like um, engage with these issues? Um, but I was also um, I don't know. I was going to say something else, but it just slipped my mind. Oh, but I, I'm also oh, curious. I'm curious, American, because now Gina's question has made me go back to Stefan's question in the chat about uh, creating safe spaces. I'm curious if there are places you feel safe online, like if there are networks, places you feel like you can do this work. I, hmm, I mean, I feel like one thing that I don't know, I'm always surprised by, which I shouldn't be, but I don't know, for some stupid reason, I always forget what my context is, but on social media, like, I guess I anticipate the algorithm's gonna sort out people I don't necessarily wanna see engage my content, but then it's like, sometimes you'll post something and you're like, you know, this is just for a certain audience or my close friends or, or other black artists or something. And then it's like immediately all these comments from people who are not that demographic. And you're just like, now there's more comment, irrelevant comments than, you know, the amount of text in the post itself. And it's just like, I don't know. Um, so that doesn't really answer your question, but I feel like there's certain artists or people that I having having them continually occur in my feed like brings me some sense of calm and like knowing that um, that's for a limited audience or that's for a particular um, group of people makes me feel like I'm I'm part of something that feels safer, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that question just makes me think of like um, in the same way that you would think about access needs at a physical event, right? You should think about that in terms of your your digital community and who you're trying to build with and what makes the most sense for that kind of gathering. You know, I think all the time about how Zoom as a platform um, privileges loudness and how that doesn't work for everyone. And like, what a quality to build into a tool, loudness. <laughs> Totally. I do want to, I'm nodding my head at, at Harsha's comment, like we don't necessarily have to name the safe spaces on this, this call with everybody here. Um, uh, we're, we're, we have, you know, three minutes left. If anyone wants to make any final comments or quickly type um, a, a burning question in the chat. Otherwise, um, do you guys have a, a final question or comment for each other? If not, I have to say I've really enjoyed your presentations and hearing from you. I wish that we had lots more time to see more of your projects presented, but I really appreciate your time. Um, and I, I want to say also to everyone who's still in the audience, um, please do 
visit the DSI's website. Uh, there's information about our upcoming Summer Institute. It'll be our first annual Summer Institute. If you're interested in getting on a mailing list to uh, find out about applications for that, which will be launched soon, you can DM your contact info to me here. I will uh, keep the window open for a while and save everybody's contact information. Um, but thanks again, everyone. Thank you for a wonderful conversation, American and Salome. It's so great to see you guys. I miss New York. <laughs> um, and yes, thank you to the artists. Thanks again to Allison. Thanks to the tech crew in the back. It was great. Thank you. Thank Have you. Have a good night, everyone.